Forget about boots and belts, scarves and shoes, hats and handbags. What elevates a simple dress to the status of knockout gown is a brilliant piece of jewelry. Whether they're precious stones or artisanally styled pieces, carefully selected jewels create instant seduction. Think of Boucheron's aptly named Dangerous Beauty Collection. A woman wearing fabulous jewels becomes a dangerous beauty. For James de Givenchy, the appeal is sometimes hidden. Jewelry is about surprises. You know, be able to go past the first impression, turn them around, and, and be surprised. The name Tiffany conjures up one image. This is the Tiffany diamond. It was actually worn by Audrey Hepburn. It was one of the only times that's ever been worn by anyone. When it comes to pearls, Mikimoto is an equally esteemed name. There are very few supermodels who ever met a precious stone they didn't like. It's actually very bouldery. I mean, you can see it, the, um, the shapes, and very round shapes. And it's very, um, very rich, very luxurious. Stylist turned designer Marina Schiano approaches her craft with a personal passion. Italian designer Leah De Gregorio works with quality materials that parallel her own style. But first, come behind the scenes at one of the industry's most precious workshops. In Paris, the Place Vendôme is where the biggest names in fine jewelry are found. The first to move to the Tony neighborhood in 1893 was Boucheron. The house quickly became a pioneer among jewelers, but more recently, its luster had faded. After Boucheron was acquired by the Gucci Group in 2000, its creative director at the time, Tom Ford, installed hip London designer Solange Azaguri Partridge to overhaul the once dusty old name. I had met him a couple of times previously in a, in a social context and almost found him one of the easiest people to speak to in the room. Ford often featured her diamonds on the Yves Saint Laurent runway, but Solange's beginnings were in 20th century art, not fashion. So I saw jewellery from that point of view as well, and I think that's how I kind of fell in love with it. And then I designed my engagement ring, which is supposedly very unlucky, so oh, really? still married though. <laughs> and now a mother, Solange also has a London-based jewellery company under her own name. She keeps her two lines separate, creatively and physically. Well, this is my Solange Azaguri hand, and this is my Boucheron hand. This ring is called Serpent, and it was um, made by Boucheron in 1971. And this is the, one of the snakes that I designed for Boucheron, this last collection. This is my chain, fringy, belly dancing ring. And then uh, this is my, these are my spinning rings. Celebrities are keen to grab her glam jewels and it's not difficult to understand why. She modernizes it, she uses beautiful stones, beautiful colors, and uh, I think she's done a great job. And she makes young women want to wear big, big jewelry. There's a lot of good in Boucheron from every age of its existence, so. There's a, there's a lot to work with. The Dangerous Beauty Collection. The metals are precious, which are gold, silver, platinum. And um, the stones, the four precious stones are emerald, ruby, sapphire, and diamond. You know, the idea behind the name was that a woman wearing fabulous jewels becomes a dangerous beauty. This workshop is is unusual because it's the only existing workshop on Place Vendôme. We do a drawing. The girls do fabulous painted drawing. These are again life-size models to show things in three-dimensional. It shows the stone buyer how many stones they need to buy. It shows the stone setter how uh, to where, to, where they were each going to go. These people build the actual piece. They build the body of it, you know, like they would make them the, the shape, they'd cut out the holes, they'd make sure it was all ready to prepare. So then it, once they've built it, it goes to the woman who polishes it by hand. I mean, it's amazing, I'll show you how she does it. Well, every hole is polished in that way with this abrasive cotton. 
and then it goes to the setter and then it's kind of zhuzhed up. It's 2,000 stones in that snake and then these guys are now preparing them to be set. They have to kind of construct around the holes because they're pave set, they have to kind of build little thingies that grab hold of the stone. They push the gold over the stones. That's how they set stones. It's all about, um, you know, jewellery that is good enough to eat. It's all about boucheron. It's got to be about boucheron. If really you, you are attracted by, by culture, I think you, it's why right because you are born for that, you know. I think it's something uh, um, really you have in your, in your skin, it's possible to say. The Givenchy name is synonymous with the glamour of couture, but over 50 years, Hubert de Givenchy expanded his empire to include ready-to-wear and licensed luxury goods. These days, the name Givenchy is popular with fashionistas for another reason. In New York, French-born James de Givenchy has started his own jewelry collection under the family name of Taffin, a name he shares with his legendary uncle, Hubert de Givenchy. The first thing you, I see is that you, you either fall in love with the stones and nature is just full of those wonderful patterns and, and surprising patterns. And, um, you know, from there, it's a great base to start from. The stone will inspire the, the piece that I will make. It's, it's about the cut, the way it comes to you, the, the color, where the color is, how it's situated in the stone and how it gets back to you. I find the stone and then I draw around it. Every stone is beautiful. I mean, whether it's, it's a sapphire and a, a real blue, but sapphires come in every color, which is wonderful. The sapphire has a great life and brilliance. The diamonds, of course, are just diamonds. They'll never be matched for brilliance, but they are, um, the cuts is what will make them interesting. The, the way it's mounted is, is a very simple mount where we're trying not to show any metal or as little metal as possible. You'll see that the stones actually are, the, the diamonds seem to be floating between the stone and the, I think it's nice to, to make jewelry not too serious. You know, it's everything that we try to do has a little bit of a, it, it's a little whimsical. Jewelry is about surprise. It, it should be, um, the pieces, you, you should look at them and then, and then see more in it. It's not just, you know, be able to go past the first impression, turn them around and, and be surprised. And uh, that's a, a big thing. Most of the jewelry we do, whether it's that clock or, or a, a simple ring, is great to just hold and, and appreciate on both sides. In a world of wealth, where the price tags of high fashion resemble the closing numbers on the NASDAQ, there lies a familiar oasis of jewels called Tiffany, undoubtedly the uptown girl's best friend. Tiffany was founded here in New York City in 1837. Charles Louis Tiffany and John B. Young founded the company. At that point, there weren't that many diamonds available in America, so re really he was instrumental in making diamonds available really to many people, uh, beginning in New York. Before the jewels grace Tiffany's main floor, pieces are created, cast, and cut at the studio upstairs. Everyone in here is, is uh, known as a model maker. That's kind of the, um, there are jewelers and then there are model makers. Model making is a, is a more demanding title because it means that, that what we're making will be a model that will then go into production. So if I make one mistake and they make a thousand pieces, that's a thousand mistakes. Well, they begin with making a model and from the model they'll create a wax model and from the wax model then 
actually the, the piece will be made because then the wax will be put into plaster and then gold is injected into it, the wax dissolves and there you have your piece. These will be uh, yellow sapphires with amethyst in spotted as you see here on the original Schlumberger design. I made all the sequins, I made the unicorn and the uh, Pegasus and this is the Phoenix which is the trilogy of the mythology, you know. This is the Tiffany diamond was 287 carats rough when it was found and it was studied for a couple of years before the first cut was ever made and it was cut down to 128 and a half carats that lives here on the main floor and we're very proud of it. It was actually worn by Audrey Hepburn in the film Breakfast at Tiffany. That was one of the only times that's ever been worn by anyone. Very few gems earned the little blue box status but one of the finest is the Lucida ring. This is the Lucida diamond. On the top of the stone, it's cut like an emerald cut with what we call step cut facets. What's very unique about this diamond is that underneath, we've developed a more brilliant faceting arrangement. Well, this one is a 2.67 carat, and this one retails for 46,000. With gems as radiant as Tiffany's treasured diamond, and as timeless as Audrey Hepburn's beauty, the name Tiffany is etched in the permanent landscape of American history. I live probably in a dreamy way. Italian-born Marina Schiano has lived a fantasy life as a top model, muse to Yves Saint Laurent and Halston, and a famed stylist for Vanity Fair magazine. She then moved into jewelry design. My family went with a bank career, which I thought was just, you know, to get a revolver and shoot would have been easier. <laughs> I came to New York without speaking no language whatsoever. I was modeled on the best way been, uh, you know, in the best pages of Vogue. I was very lucky, I was just very lucky. So my second really fashion thing was get to know Saint Laurent. Be called Alter Ego of Saint Laurent, or Muse of Saint Laurent. It wasn't very much of work for me to be a Muse of Saint Laurent because I used to dress up with my eyes closed. During her seven years at Vanity Fair, Schiano conceived many of their memorable celebrity covers. Now she is bringing her creative passion to jewelry. I had made five rings for myself. Just started just because I wanted for me, I mean, really. I was just crazy about the color and I continued to do so. This is Dark Amethyst. It's called Rock Jewelry. Always bigger than life in anything I do. It's always bigger than life. Our style is really to do, you know, to do those kind of very dramatic things. I thought in this uh, kind of a minimalist world, I thought to myself, this will be one of the biggest failure ever. And instead, people love them. But her talent doesn't stop there. Photography has started a long time. I'm trying to put together a book. I do love this, if you want to call it paparazzo, it's a, a paparazzo moment. It's just a moment that you grab from the person. It's just a rapid moment that, you know, it's yours and nobody else. I wanted to think about somebody who loves fashion, believes on style, uh, who believes on glamour, who believes on honesty, and who believes in God. I think that, you know, that was very important to me, uh, changing cities, uh, meeting very different people. I think that gave me, you know, a kind of curiosity. After living in many cities outside her native Puglia, designer Leah de Gregorio settled in Milan. Her delicate designs in gold and silver are created in an airy studio on the outskirts of the city. I really decided to start my, my own business because uh, I, I never uh, saw jewelry I liked. I liked the idea, the idea to design jewelry that give to the people who we will wear it, who will wear them. Um, I, I hope that they will uh, have a kind of emotion. 
I mostly work with gold and silver, and that's it because I think that these two metals are proper to, for my, my style. When I have to, to think or to project new things, um, I spend most of my time, you know, staying here. I try to recognize what I'm feeling and how I want to start. I start from an emotional um, feeling. These are kind of knots, simple, simple knots. There's a way to, to make knots with pearls too. And I, re I really like the, um, the idea of working with uh, metals like gold, silver, uh, in a way that is not um, Goldschmidt's uh, way of working. It's not very static in a way. The stone stays because stay, stays between the ring and the finger. Sometimes you have to find the right proportion from the between the object and the mechanism. This is gold with amber, but we can use different stones. For example, this is a kind of ruby. I think that the most exciting moment is when you are uh, thinking and doing the new things. Over 100 years ago, the world's first cultured pearl was removed from an oyster raised by Kokichi Mikimoto, earning him the title Pearl King. After overcoming many setbacks, Mikimoto devoted his life to cultivating the most perfect pearls that man and even nature could ever imagine. The word Mikimoto really stands for, for luxury and for quality. Only one pearl in a hundred is qualified to bear the Mikimoto name, and the process of producing that perfect pearl is lengthy. Mikimoto only uses top best 5% of the top quality, and we wholesale the rest of the pearls. First we have to grow the oyster itself. It takes about three years to grow the oyster. Then we implant the nucleus into the oyster. So then we have to grow the oyster for another three years in the, in the ocean. Then we harvest the pearl, so it takes about five years. They become warm and they take on the same temperature that our body has and they, the luster is just so exquisite. Women have always loved pearls. Everybody knows that looking at the pearl is the best quality of pearls. Since its beginnings in Rome in 1884, the lavish opulence of Bulgari jewelry has captivated the world, with a history and tradition almost as rich as Rome itself. Around 1880, my grandfather came to Italy from Greece, and he went to Naples. He was a very poor guy. He began to work what he, he knew how to work, the silver, he was a silversmith. He was only a silversmith, but when my father and my uncle began to work, they pushed him to enter the business of jewelry. The Italian people, as you may know, they are very big spender of jewelry, of fashion, of nice things. 
and from their original store on Rome's Via Condotti, new generations of Bulgari have built on the Italian lust for luxury. There is in this company passion, uh, typical of a company that is owned by a family that wants to see not only good numbers, but also uh, good products. And the quality um, of these products is uh, very much attached with the uh, skill of specific workers. You are talking about a real uh, artisan. They are small artisan that works for us. If we consider an important piece of jewelry, sometimes it takes seven, eight months to do it, from the designing to the manufacturing. The jewels that are the most expensive one, the unique pieces, and they are done 100% by hand. They have to set each single stone by hand, and uh, the work is very difficult because, especially when the stone is small, This style uh, certainly has been uh, conceived here in, in Rome, then is influenced a lot by uh, the Italian uh, style, the Italian culture. The company has an history of uh, a very focused history, uh, jewelry and watches. But now, since uh, the beginning of the 90s, we have started uh, to work, as I said, to enlarge our product portfolio. By expanding watches and jewelry into an entire range of luxury goods, Bulgari maintains worldwide growth. With 60 stores around the globe, the family is constantly building their brand, proved with the reopening of New York's Fifth Avenue flagship store. My father told me always a lot of very important American, especially American, coming to Italy, coming to Rome, where his very, very best clients. craftsmanship is amazing. They're just, they're, they're just beautifully, beautifully, beautifully made. The best, it's the best jewelry in the world. It's actually very bulgary. I mean, you can see it, the, um, the shapes, the very round shapes. And it's very, um, very rich, very luxurious. I would say all over the world, but especially in Asia and United States, Bulgari um, makes an effort to uh, become closer to the final client. It's a typical sign of friendliness, if you want. Now, the revolving door in the, in the stores in the United States means uh, come and, and see, you know, and browse, don't, don't, don't be worried. It's a kind of style that comes from uh, tradition, from experience. The challenge we have in front of us is uh, the ability to um, evolve, and for that reason be contemporary, without losing our roots and our traditions.